Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the general discussion series and it is a question and answer session from people in San Diego. Presented by Jesus on the 3rd of November 2013 in San Diego, California, USA. This is session 2, part 1. Such a thing. But it is an interesting question about anger. Um, the way most people handle anger is, is very interesting, in fact. For the majority of people, anger is a passive-aggressive thing. I don't know if you've noticed that in your society, but it's very common here, I notice, when we're, when we're here, how passive-aggressive everyone is with their anger. When I say passive-aggressive, do you understand what I mean by that? Like, it's like simmering inside, but never allowed to be really expressed except using some basic techniques that the average American actually um, supports or, you could say, allows. So here's some of the techniques. Technique number one that you have is sarcasm. Huh? Have you noticed that? I, it's interesting the humour that you have on telly. And we've watched a little bit of telly since we've been here. We don't have a telly at home, so we watched a little bit of telly and we're just watching the type of humour you have. Now, your type of humour generally wouldn't work at all in Australia, which is interesting because particularly the talk shows that are meant to be funny. You know the talk back shows that you have that are meant to be funny? Well, from an Australian's perspective, they, they don't sound very funny to us. They sound like a heap of sarcasm directed at other people, which uh, brings me to the second form of expression of anger, which is criticism. But it's not criticism, or, or you could say criticism where the person's inviting it, it's criticism of everybody possible, right, basically. Um, in other words, it's done to build up yourself and pull down another. So, so build up self, and then so is the sarcasm. And pull down another. That's the primary um, motivations, it appears. So sarcasm, criticism. Now these are not what you would e most people would even classify as anger-based um, actions, but they are. They are driven by internal rage about things. Any other ideas of what you do as a society to, to address with your anger? Sorry, gossip? Yes, gossip's great, yeah. And in fact, uh, one of the things that amazes us sometimes, even in Australia, sometimes if, you know, when we're travelling, we get to turn on telly occasionally, it's pretty rare, but... Um, sometimes we've noticed that there's gossip, like people who are experts in gossip from the US, who actually appear on Australian television. <laughs> it's a, like, we go, whoa, that's amazing, you know. They've got no idea what they're saying is true or not. And, and in fact, uh, oftentimes it doesn't really matter to... Uh, and what we've noticed in Australia is it doesn't matter on television there whether they present the truth or not. They don't care whether they present the truth or not. Um, and it seems to me that the US is very similar to Australia in that way, that you know, it doesn't seem to care whether it's true or not, it's just a way of getting a laugh or discussing somebody. And really it's pulling down people generally. And I think this is why um, a lot of people in the US are so fascinated with actors and actresses and their lives and music stars and their lives and what's going on with their lives and so forth because it makes them feel better about their own life right? a lot of the times. Anything else you do? Sorry? Part, the party scene? Yeah, I think there's even bigger things than that that we can list, so let's... Uh, peaceable assembly. We're talking about how you express your anger in your society. 
if we use the mics, if you're going to make any comment other than the single one. <laughs> the sit-in that we had with the 99% versus the 1% in our country. Right. We had a whole big uh, problem with that, that people were very angry about, so they decided to camp out in the streets. Right, okay. So you could say... Um, what? Protest, yeah, uh, peaceable protest, ostensibly peaceable protest, but sometimes it turns violent, of course. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Lawrence, you were going to say? So if we just hand the mics around. I think sometimes when people hold, up, hold it up a bit People closer. don't show up on time if they're late. Yeah. It's a form of uh, anger, passive aggression. Okay, so again, protest is another. So, that, so if we write it down, protest as another form of all types of forms. Right. It was funny, um, we were, went on the train yesterday. You call it the trolley here, don't you? And, um, and we were, it, it was a packed trolley, it was peak hour, it was a packed trolley. And uh, not yesterday, it was the day before. And we were on the trolley and we were about to get off. And we stood at the door to get off and the doors opened. And the people who were getting on just started walking on. Like it was almost like pushing you back. <laughs> uh, you can't even get off. And, and we stepped out onto that. And then this lovely lady behind us said, my God, what's everybody doing here? Like, but it wasn't really rage. It was just like a protest about the fact that everybody was being unkind and unloving to her, you know, getting off the trolley. So that's pretty common, I, I would assume. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe controlling people. Okay, so control... Yep. And if I can add to that manipulation. Yep. It's a very common form of passive aggressive expression of anger. Um, I was thinking of like a certain a certain feeling of, of like nihilism that we have, like where there's excuse my language, but there's kind of like, well, fuck it attitude yeah. towards everything in a sense. So can we say dismissive? Yeah. Um, probably dismissive of things like uh, right the way through from a passive dismissive right the way through to aggressive dismissal yeah dismissive yeah uh, non-conformity rebellion sorry non-conformity yeah yeah I, I don't think you're very good at that to be honest <laughs> <laughs> you might think you are, but I've, go to Canada. There, you get you get a lot more nonconformity there than you do here. I see, but uh, I'll write it down anyway. <laughs> yep. Yes. Uh, so, so a root, just being plain downright root. <laughs> yep. Okay. If you're going to talk more than one word, you need to get the microphone. <laughs> we channel it into our political beliefs and systems. Yeah, and what do you do with your political systems? You do a lot of lobbying, don't you? Which is a form of control, manipulation, isn't it, in the end? Yeah. Sports, yes, I would say that's a fairly... Great one. That's worldwide, that one. <laughs> worldwide, that, that one. And that's why a lot of men in particular are so interested in sports because it gives them an outlet for their anger and it gives them an outlet for their fear and a lot of other outlets, actually. So that's why sports are so popular. Yeah. You laugh at things. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Com competition. Compet competition. I'm struggling with that word. And on the end. Yes? Yep, that should have all been set into a mic, but it's very good. Pouting, refusing. Um, one thing I notice that many of you do is 
you believe yourself to be higher than the anger that you feel. Have you noticed that? So you believe yourself to be more developed than the anger that you actually feel. You're not allowing yourself even to feel the anger, so you revert to a lot of these kind of forms of expression of anger because you often are refusing to allow yourself to believe that you're even angry. And so what, what, one of the main problems we have here when we give feedback to people on individual discussions is, say, well, now you're angry. And they go, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Yes, you are, actually. If you, just, if you just allowed yourself to sit with it a bit, you'd actually connect to some anger and that would probably be good to you, not to express it to others, but to actually feel it. Because when you deny rage inside of yourself, that's when everyone around you feels it the most. And many of you don't understand that. Many of you feel that when you deny rage, that's when everyone around you feels it the least. And it's not true, actually. And so you are used to, in your society quite often, you are used to pandering to angry people. You are used to doing what they want. All they've got to do is almost threaten you with anger and then you're doing what they want already. Right? Now, many of these things that we do are just a way of releasing some of the built-up rage that's developed within us. That's just a way. Now, this is what, in the first century, getting back to the question, this is what a lot of people were doing with regard to the temple. They were, they were gossiping about it, you know, criticising it, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, being sarcastic about the fact that they just had to pay. They tried to control and manipulate it, and in fact they tried to even do deals with the people who were, who were selling them the animals, you know, um, in order to manipulate the price somehow. Um, a lot of them decided they weren't going to conform, so they decided they weren't going to do what... Even though they believed in the Torah, they weren't going to do what it said as a result of it. And a lot of them were doing all of these things, except for perhaps sports and laughing. <laughs> Pretty much everything else was in the list for them, right? And so when I pointed out to them what was going on, they connected with their anger. For the, for the first time in many cases. And for many people, when they connect with their anger for the first time, they just go berserk. Right? And I'm not suggesting that's what you need to do. I'm just saying that's what happens for many people. They just go berserk. And as a result of that, there is usually, and quite frequently, if you look at what happens on telly nowadays or with different countries, quite frequently, a riot ensues. Right? because of all this built-up rage that's within. Now, what we notice when we're travelling a lot is that a lot of people do not understand how much anger they have and how much they want and demand other people to do what they want. And we see that as a very unloving projection at other people. Does that make sense? And what we find is most people believe they've resolved that issue in themselves. And most people, particularly, who come along to sessions about love, think they're already loving to a degree. Right? When there's very little self-reflection, because most of the time, these emotions and many others exist within them, which is an indication of the build-up of anger and rage within them. Now, sometimes it's aimed towards one gender. So, in other words, the, there might be women who try to do some of these things towards their men. Right? So that's a, the rage of the woman developed towards the opposite gender, aimed towards that gender in terms of having things fixed up for them. The same applies to men. There's a build-up of rage and anger in men. In fact, you know why most men go fishing and go to the pub? Because they're actually quite sad about their relationships and they try to avoid their relationships as a result to avoid their own sadness. And so they go and do things that the woman doesn't desire to do and they do it purposefully. They want to go to the pub so the woman doesn't want to come so that gives them a bit of time off from the projection of rage. Does that make sense? Or they want to go you know, fishing and they know for the majority of women they don't want to come. Right? They don't want to sit out on a boat rocking, getting a bit sick, drinking a few beers and occasionally wheeling up a, uh, a, an animal to slaughter. <laughs> so... so 
so that's a way they can get away from them and enjoy the fact that they're having some peace and quiet from an emotional perspective. And a lot of that is driven by, again, by anger, right? A lot of it's driven by anger. And a lot of what we do in our day-to-day -day life, even the choices we make and everything, are driven by anger, in fact. Far more than what we're usually aware. Okay, Is this one that if you could comment about objectifying the opposite gender as, a, uh, as an expression of rage? Do you, um, you mean in terms of sexually objectifying? Yeah, the like a lot of women um, talk a lot about men and are critical of men or their bodies or and project a lot of men, but yeah. often there's a lot of rage in that, isn't there? Of course, yeah. And the reverse and vice versa. is true, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, I think you've said. Okay, sorry. It needs to be said. <laughs> I left it as a question, but then I answered it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly true. Is that oftentimes what we do is we're so angry with one gender that we start criticising even something that God put on that gender, such as the man's penis, for example. <laughs> a lot of women objectify or crit are critical of that as a way of pulling down the male. And, uh, and, and that is an expression of their anger, in fact. When we have like class-based systems, that's usually an expression of the anger as well. So, so when women have a group that excludes men, or men have a group that exclude women, that's all about anger, actually. So the average... Uh, do you have uh, things like... Well, you have bucks parties here, I think, don't you? Like, what do you call them? Stag parties. What's the opposite from a woman's perspective? Bachelorette party, isn't it? Yeah. And usually it's only the other women who are their friends or the other men that are their friends that are invited. Is that the way it works? Yeah. That in itself is an expression of anger, in fact. Excluding one gender over another is always an expression of some anger or rage at some point. And culturally, we have things where we exclude people as well. So, and sometimes we choose to exclude them via... You know, you might, for example, here, many people can speak two languages, right? But they still continue to speak the language that excludes the other person from being involved in their conversation. That's an expression of anger. Because if you loved everybody and you knew that one person could only speak English but you can speak Spanish and English, what language would you choose? You'd choose English. Yeah, that's the kind thing to do. You wouldn't choose Spanish and just have the person completely at sea, right? And things like that are frequently chosen because we're quite angry. We, we, we want to, about something, about, and you know, sometimes it's culturally we're angry about something, or from a male or female perspective we're angry about something, or we just have general anger about control or lack of control. So therefore we want to manipulate every situation to our own benefit. And in fact, uh, many of us, when we're angry, become ultra-selfish. Right, so I'd like to put that up as number 14, but it's one of the major ones that we see happening in most Western societies. There's this development of almost complete selfishness and being self-absorbed. Not being in tune with what's happening in the rest of the world or in the rest of your community or in the rest of an audience or in the, just being totally focused upon what you want and that's it. Now... I think we had uh, an example of that down the front with two women yesterday. Did you notice that? Where they were just totally absorbed in their own self, right? And that's all. That's all they were absorbed in. They didn't care about the rest of you. They didn't care how much demand they had. They didn't care they were jumping in on conversations. They didn't care about any of those things. And that's because of their own complete self-absorption. And those two ladies actually yesterday were interesting because they felt they were loving. They felt they were developed in love. Right? But how did it feel on the receiving end to you? It didn't feel very loving to you, did it? Like for the majority of you who were here yesterday, you would have noticed that. So this selfishness is also an expression of anger. We get so angry that we haven't got what we wanted in our life that we start deciding that we're going to get everything we want now. And everyone else can be damned, really, is the way we see it, generally. We don't care very much about what other people feel. Thanks, Carl. 
これマイスキングだな Could you talk about what we can do to help ourselves get in touch with these emotions, fear, anger that are below the surface that we don't even know that are there, or we know that you know, it's there, but we really can't even feel it that much? Well, it gets back to our discussion yesterday, really. I think I've already told you how to do that, to be frank. The, the, the way to do it is quite simple use your will to be self reflective, and to be far more self reflective than you're currently being. You know, every time you notice one of these things coming out of you, ex see it as what it really is a passive, ex aggressive way of expressing your rage. Like, and then question yourself why is it present? Why is it there? What, what's the underlying controls that I have that are in place here? So you see, like, what, what I find happening quite uh, frequently in discussions is that everyone wants some kind of a rule book, right? This is why the Bible did so well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the most published book in the world by, by millions of copies, the Bible is. And why is that? Because it gave some basic rules that the average person could just read and say, I'll follow that. Without having to think or feel anything, you see? And what I find happening quite frequently in discussions with people is that that's what people want me to do. Provide a whole list of rules where you don't have to think or feel or be self-reflective. That you just follow the rule book and everything will be all right. And that also applies to getting to your emotions, Carl. Like, the choice to get to your emotions is driven by you. Only you. So only you can decide what you're going to do to get to some of these emotions or even awareness that some of these things are linked with your anger can only happen by you being willing to reflect upon yourself. Now, when we say we're in denial, there's a difference between, like, let's talk about perhaps two things because this is very much connected with the discussion about rage, right? So let's talk about two things. We often say that we have been, the first one is ignorant. Right? In other words, we say, I didn't know, you can't expect me to have known. That's what we tell ourselves and that's what we tell other people. And you know, many people get to the spirit world, they're living in the hills and they're screaming at God, why am I here? You can't expect me to have known whatever they need to have known, right? And in fact, there's a lot of rage in that, this whole idea or concept that you can't expect me to know how to be loving. The reality is the excuse of ignorance is just an excuse. Ignorance is actually a choice that we make just like all other choices that we make. Remember, we wrote down the five things on the side of the board. Maybe we should write them down again and we can see how each one of these things relate to the expression of anger. So what was the first one? All right, next one was will. Next one, humility. Truth and love. Okay, so if we just keep those down the side, let's have a look at how this reflects. If we are ignorant, it's because generally, not always, but generally, particularly in Western society where we have a barrage of information coming from the world to us at any one point in time, we have a barrage of information coming from the world to us about ourselves and also from the world to us about the world itself. We have huge amounts of information. Most of us in Western society can read, so we're not limited by what we can read. Most of us have a television, right? so we watch something at least on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and so therefore we have a huge amount of information at our fingertips. What information do we choose to engage? Most of the time it's information that just brings us a bit of pleasure. That's the information we choose to engage. Right? And that's because we choose to be ignorant about what's really going on. It's a choice for many, for many of us. 
Now, it's not a choice for everyone in the world. There are many people in the world that have no education at all. They're never given an opportunity. If you go to Kenya, the average girl doesn't get educated at all. Right? So if you go to Africa and Kenya, the average girl doesn't get educated at all and 75% of them will be raped by the time they're an adult. Now, that, that's a lot worse situation, isn't it, than what we have in Western society generally. Right? So you could, you could forgive a person in that situation for, one, for, for being ignorant because obviously many of them don't desire it. It's forced upon them. But in our countries, Australia, England, Europe, here, here in America and most Western countries, there's no excuse to be ignorant, actually. It's a choice that we've made to be ignorant because we want to ignore a whole heap of things. It does come from the word ignore, does it not? <laughs> and what is he ignore? Isn't that just a step away from denial? Isn't it? And if we deny things, can you see that this is, a, this is a, about using our will? You can also see that this is about not being humble to what's happening in the world around us. And you can also see that it's not wanting to know the truth of what's happening in the world around us or in our personal lives. So if we choose to remain ignorant about our own situation, we're actually in denial of developing our will properly, developing humility and developing our desire for truth. And so we could choose to no longer be ignorant, couldn't we? And that would mean that we are interested in everything that's happening around us. That we know what, what's happening. And also know the results of our own choices on the world around us. Right? Okay. What do you think the second thing might be that we do? Well, I feel the main thing we do, the second thing we do that's really quite negative as well, is the link, which is the denial. We start denying with ourselves. We go, no, I'm not like that. I'm more concerned than the average person. You know, we, our country goes to war and we go... I'm more concerned. I wouldn't vote for that. It's not my fault. It's not something inside of me emotionally that's creating this desire. We deny our own emotional condition so much that we don't see the link between two things. Between our emotion that is stored inside of us and what that causes in the world. And also in our personal life. So, I'll give you an example of this. If something doesn't go smoothly in my life, I don't blame everybody else for that. I go, wow, there must be some emotion in me that causes it to not go smoothly. Because I know that in the end, once I'm at one with God, everything will go smoothly. Everything. Like... And I have had glimpses of that, you could say. Like I've had days where all I've had to do is think about something that I wanted to do and other people arranged it for me. And I'd never called them or anything. They just arranged it. I didn't project at them that they had to arrange it. I was perfectly happy to arrange it myself. And yet they still arranged it. And I've had days where that's, I've had a series of events like that in, throughout the day where I've decided, well, today I've got to do these five things. And, and sure enough, all of those things happen really, really smoothly. In fact, now what I've learned to do is learn to just feel the desire, make sure the desire is pure. In other words, not selfish, not for just myself, but the, re the reasons why I have these desires are for you know, other people oftentimes and, and also 
to express the truth of how I feel. And all of a sudden, a lot of things happen as a result. They're drawn together as a result. So I know now that if things don't go smoothly, then it means there's something wrong. So Mary knows that when we go out to dinner, for example, I always get what I want. It's not because I demand it. Right? I don't, don't, it's not like that. It's, I go there, I know exactly what I want before I go. Wherever we go to dinner, I know exactly why I'm going to that place. <laughs> I know exactly what I want. And I'm always kind and considerate with the way in which I deal with the staff that, that are preparing our meal and generous with them as well. Even in Australia where people don't tip, I tip. Right? And, and so I'm always focused on how can I show people appreciation for the fact that they've given me what I want. Now, as a result of that, the majority of people when we go out to dinner always give me what I want. Always. Not because I'm demanding. Now, I've gone out with another guy to dinner and he sits there scowling most of the time because he never gets what he wants. And I'm going, well... And he's saying that it's the fault of the... of the proprietor or the you know, serving staff or something like that. But I'm going to myself, well, no, that, that's not what it's like for me. I always get what I want. Even when somebody's really upset, I still seem to get what I want. They seem to be kind to me, at least. And so why is it that that happens? There's got to be something inside of the individual that attracts things, isn't there? Yeah? Well, it's based on how much love is coming out of your soul in terms of what is going to come back to you in most of these situations. So, so when we go out to dinner, myself and Mary, and this is not a criticism of Mary, but we often find that Mary doesn't get what she wants. <laughs> Isn't that true, darling? Yeah. And, and so, and Mary has some emotions that come up generally of that. One of them is that, one is that the serving staff very rarely listen to her. So she'll say very clearly what she would like, but they don't do it. Right? Now, we don't see that as a problem with them. We see that as something going on inside of the soul of the person that that's happening to that needs to be worked through. Now, when Mary connects to that emotionally, she feels like she goes right back back into a family of like the fact that nobody really listened to her no one wanted no one wanted to give her what she wanted and she's yet to release the grief of that does that make sense and because she's yet to release the grief of that often that's what gets attracted when we go out to dinner now once mary works through that emotion she will be the same as me we'll go out to dinner and we'll both get what we want and that happens a lot more frequently now than it used to doesn't it now does that make sense? And just to give you an idea of our, the different way in which we deal with a situation, this, was, this is an event that happened nearly six or seven years ago. So it would be when we were coming back from England, the first trip together, it would be six years ago. And I think I've told this story in another seminar where I was the only person on the plane that didn't receive a meal. So I, we, we pre-order our meal because we generally vegan or fruit is what we eat. And, um, and so I had a pre-ordered meal, which was a vegan meal. And uh, everybody, and Mary had a pre-ordered vegan meal, she received her meal, and I did not. And Mary goes, tell them. I go, no, I don't want to tell them. I need to feel some things. So I'm there in the plane, this was from England to Australia, crying in one of the seats on the corner, Right, about the fact that I didn't get my meal. <laughs> right? And I connected to quite a number of different emotions in that place where I felt like people ignore me, people don't even notice that I'm around. And this was what I was like in my, in my family as a kid. I, because I did everything for everybody when I was a child, nobody noticed me at all. You know, the other, my other brother and sister in our family, they got pretty much everything they wanted if, if, and usually because they complained. <laughs> and therefore got it, whereas I never complained and so therefore never got anything, right? And, and, and I felt there was sort of almost this punishment for being more loving than that. 
So I was just feeling about that, had to cry about that. Anyway, after I finished crying, which was about 20 minutes, I think, this host, host comes up, a male, I think it was a male host, comes up, said, you didn't get a meal, did you? I said, no, I didn't. Um, he said, well, I can find you a meal. I said, oh, well, I'm vegan. It's probably, you know, there are probably no meals left, you know. Like, I don't eat meat or, or any animal products or anything. He goes, let me see. So he goes off and he brings me back a first class vegan meal. And I didn't even have to ask for it. He just brought it. And Mary's looking at my vegan meal going, <laughs> it, was, it was a super nice meal, wasn't it? As far as plain fare goes. And, uh, and Mary was then wondering why she had advised me to, to ask for, a, for the meal in the first place. But to me, that illustrates what I'm trying to illustrate to you, and that is most of us don't understand the link between what is in our soul, what needs to come out, and what we've created. And it doesn't mean that we're being punished or anything. It just means that there's something in our soul that prevents things from running smoothly in our day-to-day -day life. And so what most of us t finish up doing is denying this link. So you get a headache, for example, as I talked about yesterday. What do you do? You go and get the headache tablet. That is a denial of a link emotionally because the link is denial of sadness suppression of sadness causes headaches all you need to do is have a cry and your headache will probably disappear and you're refusing to have a cry internally so your headache will appear and then you deny the link between the headache and what emotion you're trying to suppress and so what you do is you search for an alternative way of suppressing it which is some kind of tablet, right? some kind of pill. We do this all the time. We deny the link between the emotion and the causes in the world and, I should add, in ourselves. Well, probably the better way to say this is the emotion and the effects it has upon the world. Because the, uh, the cause is the emotion itself. Right? The cause is the emotion itself that we're in denial of. And we choose to deny. So when we choose to deny, we do all sorts of things. Sarcasm is a choice to deny. Every time you get sarcastic with another person, you're choosing to deny something inside of yourself. And instead, you're reverting to an angry expression of your denial to somebody else. It's not kind at all. It's very unloving. Right? It's actually an expression of anger. I would define that as anger, an expression of anger. The average person says, oh, it's just sarcasm. You know, what's wrong with you? Surely you can take it, <laughs> you know. But it's actually a very unloving ta action to take. So when we choose ignorance or we choose denial, we are setting ourselves up for passive-aggressive expression of our rage. What we're doing is we're creating a, you could say, like a fertile ground for our rage to just sit in and stay, stay, stay there, stay there, stay there. And eventually it's going to build up and build up. And at some point, we'll revert to this overt expression of our rage. And that's what happened in the first century when I yelled out to everybody, don't you see what's going on? You're all getting ripped off here, <laughs> you know? This is all unloving. Do you think God would agree to this? And of course, in their hearts, they all felt, definitely not, definitely not. But, it, but there was so much built-up anger in them by this stage that they then thought the result would be have a riot rather than just feel how angry they felt about the situation. And this is why, like in Europe, for example, there's often riots at soccer grounds, right? Because there's so much built up rage and then when the team that they support doesn't get the result, bang, the rage flares into violence. And often that's the case. Many of us are just a smidge away from violence, actually. Just a small 
distance away from actual violence. And that's why we often are also on tender hooks with each other because we realise, oh, that person's just a smidge away from violence. That person's just a little distance. I've got to be careful with that person. I don't want to trigger that person or say something that might harm that person. They'll be, you know, flare up and then I'll be in lots of trouble after that. And so what we finish up doing is we pander to the violence. We pander to the persons who are in this rage. And this is a very common thing that we've noticed here in particular in the USA. But it happens frequently in most countries, to be honest, in different ways. It just depends on the cultural acceptance of, of, those, of the ways in which it occurs. So, for example, when we went to Brazil, many of the women have a huge amount of issue, rage issues with men. And all you have to do is say that to them and they'll walk out on you. And then many of the, them together, men and women, have a huge amount of um, issues about their belief systems. In other words, if you just say to them, look, um, and, and they're very interested in what I would classify as spiritualism belief systems, of course. So, so you know, they are often very, very influenced by spirits. And if you tell them exactly what's going on with the spirit, they're in a rage with you, like, so much of a rage that although we had at the time, I think then he was there, we had about, uh, at the time before we come, there was like 50 or 60 possibly coming along to a group. We rock up, they hear about a few things that we've said, and now five people rock up. And we had, I think, one in Sao Paulo, there was three people other than the people who were travelling who came to our <laughs> seminar. Three people. <laughs> in a city of 20-something million people that's how much rage there was about the things I was talking about with regard to spirits the spirits themselves wouldn't even they were so angry they wouldn't even allow anybody to come <laughs> to our sessions but it's all because of this denial of emotion or wanting to remain ignorant of what's really going on yeah